So hi everyone. So the break time is up. We will welcome our next speaker, Angela Lowe, diet, uh, dietitian. Hello, Angela. Hi. Hi. We can hear you very well, so I will let you go. Okay, so my name is Angela Lo. I'm a clinical dietitian at St. Mary's Hospital. And next slide, please. So currently I'm working at the St. Mary's Hospital in the surgery and ICU. And I also work with patients who require parenteral nutrition. So that's the IV nutrition. So I've graduated from McGill in December, 2019. And I started working at St. Mary's right away. And I'm also trained in all of the departments in St. Mary. So in internal medicine, geriatrics, ICU, surgery, oncology, nephrology, diabetes clinic, and in obstetrics. I've also worked a little bit at LaSalle Hospital because it's the same serious and they needed help. So I worked a little bit in their ICU, long-term care, internal medicine, and surgery floors. Next slide, please. So what does a dietitian do? It's someone who uh, help people choose uh, foods that are healthy and uh, maintain their health through healthy eating. So in Quebec, there are two job titles, dietitian and nutritionist, which means the same thing. But in other provinces and also in the States, um, it's only dietitian that refers to the, the profession. Because in the States, anyone who takes a class in nutrition can call himself a nutritionist, but it's only dietitian who has all the credentials and uh, training to work in this profession. Next slide. So uh, there are different uh, departments or fields that you can go through once you graduate with a dietetics degree. So there's clinical diet, uh, clinical nutrition, so which is what I do. I work in the hospital, but you can also work in clinics, rehabs, long-term care facilities, and you provide care to patients who are sick. There's also food service management, so you can work in hospital kitchen, residence, senior home, school, prison, or even companies, uh, cafeterias. So you mainly work in food service. So you do menu analysis, you develop menus, you do budgeting, costing. You just make sure that the menu is meets the nutritional guidelines and you make sure that the food is safe for the, the target audience. Then in the hospital kitchen, you will just lead a team of food service employees and diet technicians, and you would uh, make sure that the hospital food uh, meets the standards. Next slide. So you can also work in the community. So for example, in school boards, sports centers, like the gyms, in community health centers or CLSC, you can also do private practice or own like your private clinic. Uh, you could also work in grocery chains, media. So it's a lot of uh, departments you can work in. So in the community, you would work with the general population just to promote healthy eating in general. There's, you can also work in the government with Health Canada or in non-governmental organizations. You can do research, you can teach at school, and you can also work in pharmaceutical or food industries. Next slide. So as a clinical dietitian, my job is to take care of sick patients and make sure that uh, their nutrition is, is good. So I would assess the nutritional status and I would determine what their nutritional problem is. Then I would develop a plan and I would make sure that I follow the plan and um, see how they're doing. And sometimes I also need to do some teachings with the family or the patient themselves. So I work with different healthcare professionals and with the goal of treating the patient. Next slide. So some things that I do is that I check for the food and drug interactions. I also calculate the patient's nutritional needs. So how much calories they need, how much uh, protein they need and how much liquid they need. If a patient cannot eat, then sometimes they would need a feeding tube. So I would need to write down the protocol and tell the doctor which product to use, how much and what's the schedule. If tube feeding doesn't work, then I would prescribe IV nutrition. So that's the dietitian who calculate how much protein to give, how much calories to give. And um, if a patient can eat but is not eating enough, then I could do a calorie count. So I would tell the nurses to write down what, all the things that the patient is eating, then I would calculate if they're meeting. And I would do charting and I would also do teaching. And uh, if I have time, I would stay up to date with continuing education. Next slide. So some of the points that I need to include in my nutrition assessment are uh, the patient's food history. So what he eats at home, like a 24-hour diet recall, 
I also need their height, their weight, and any history of weight loss, weight gain, I would calculate their BMI. Then I would look at the lab test, uh, look at their meds. If necessary, I would do a physical exam. So I would look at any weight, uh, weight loss, muscle loss. I would look at the temporal wasting, like muscle loss from uh, the hands, also clavicle, uh, quadriceps. So there's a lot of ways to look and see if the patient is malnourished. And if a patient is not swallowing well, so if the nurse tell me, oh, this patient has difficulty swallowing, is coughing with their meals, then we can also do a swallow assessment. And this could be done either with a dietitian, with an occupational therapist, or with um, a speech language pathologist. And I will also look at the patient's uh, past medical history and all of that needs to be included in my plan. Next slide. So the type of clientele is really uh, big. Like you can work in different fields. So depending on the hospital or your specialty, like there's no fixed uh, target population. So you can work in neonatal, in pediatrics, you can work with pregnant lady, you can work in weight management in bariatric surgery uh, centers. You could also work in eating disorders, sports nutrition. Then in the hospital, there's the medicine unit. So there's all different kinds of um, medical conditions like diabetes, heart disease, pneumonia, malnutrition, so anything. There's also the endocrinology department. So you would mostly do diabetes diet teachings and you will also help the doctor manage the insulin and the medications. There's cardiology, so we would do heart healthy diet teaching. Uh, next slide. Nephrology, so you would do diet teachings to patients who have a kidney disease or who require dialysis. In oncology, you would mainly see patients who come in for their chemo treatments and you would help manage the side effects. Uh, in geriatrics, you would see elderly patients who are often malnourished who are, who have a swallow uh, difficulty. Then there are higher, uh, higher care specialties like trauma, burns, intensive care units, and they often require nutrition support. So enteral nutrition is tube feeding or parenteral nutrition is IV nutrition. Then there's the surgery floor and you would do diet teaching for patients who just got surgery. Next slide. So it's very easy to find a job because uh, there's not only you can work in the hospital, but there's also different fields as we saw in the previous slides. And many hospitals are looking for dietitians on their recall list. So that's uh, dietitians for availability and who replace vacation, sick leave, uh, any type of uh, leaves. And they often hire new grads, especially if you did an internship at that specific hospital, they would hire you um, quickly. Uh, but it is harder to get a permanent position, especially in the hospital. So it depends on the staff turnover. Next slide. So why I chose this profession is that I love food like uh, everyone else, but I also like to learn about different diseases and uh, being a dietitian, it's the only job that ties in medicine and food. So that's like the perfect match. And so if you like food, you have a strong science background, you want to learn more about nutrition and how it relates to health, then this is the perfect uh, profession for you. Next slide. So the best aspect of this profession is that you help people become more healthy through diet. So as we all say, food is medicine. So you help patient, uh, you could help patient reverse their chronic disease through dietary modifications. There are a lot of career opportunities and you, got, you get to work with different healthcare professionals. There's also a lot of teaching opportunities. And if you work in clinic, then um, you could develop like long lasting relationships with your patients. There is also a good work-life balance. Like you only work eight hour shift and when you're done, you're done. You don't really have a stress um, uh, afterwards. And a lot of dietitians who work in the hospital also have their own private practice. You can balance like two jobs at the same time. And uh, you also get to work with food. So one of the, well, the worst aspects of the profession is that uh, people mistake you as the food police and you get criticized whenever you eat something unhealthy. And a lot of people have a misconception about nutrition. They think they know everything, but in fact, they don't. And we're the nutrition expert. So there's a lot of um, time we spent to just debunk myths and uh, you need to advocate for your profession. The dietitians have a low salary like, compared to other healthcare professionals, but one of the main causes of that is that we don't need a master's uh, degree, but it might change in the future. 
uh, people think that we're just waitress, like patients, they're ungrateful sometimes and they just ask us uh, to change their menu, but we don't have any control over what is served in the hospital. And they just think that we're here to adjust their menus. And sometimes they don't appreciate our work and working in the hospital during COVID, sometimes it's a lot of burnout. Next, next slide. So in order to become a dietitian, there are three universities who offers a diet dietetics degree. So the French University is Université de Montréal and Université de Laval at Quebec. And the only English university is McGill. So in general, you need to a bachelor's degree of at least 115 credits. And that includes 40 weeks of a stage, so of internship. Next slide. So if you're from Quebec, you need to have a uh, deck in science de la nature or health science, and you need to have your science prerequisites. If you're if you don't have all your prerequisites, you might need to ask like the admission department or to, and they can clarify with you. And in general, you need a or score like cut air of around thirty, but it varies each year. So you need to look at uh, your specific year and see uh, what is the cut air necessary. Some of the French school need an interview or a test, but I'm not too sure about it. Next slide. So this is an example, or this is the program grade at McGill. So it's the 3.5 years over nine terms and it's 115 degree uh, credits. And um, in the beginning, you will start with more general science courses like biochemistry, microbiology, uh, metabolism. And then as the, you go further in, into the degree, it's more targeted towards dietetics. And you would learn clinical nutrition, one, two, three, nutrition throughout all health, uh, all life stages. There's also two fun classes called uh, food fundamentals. And you get to uh, do like cooking tests uh, in our McGill cooking lab. There's also classes more related to uh, food service management, like accounting, human resources, and how to like manage costing and food service. And then there's the stages that are integrated throughout the, the program. Next slide. So this is the hospital I currently work in, St. Mary's. Next slide. So I work in general surgery. So as you can see, there are many surgeries that, and depending on which surgery, um, I would do uh, diet teaching for when they go home. Next slide. And then there's the ICU nutrition support. So in the pictures on the left, um, there's a patient who requires a intubation. So there's a tube that helps them breathe. So since they have a tube down their throat to help them breathe, they cannot eat. So this is where the dietitian comes in and uh, help um, give them enteral nutrition. So that's when there's a tube from the nose into the stomach and we would provide nutrition through that tube. And if the gastrointestinal system, so your stomach or intestines, do not work, then we would need to give the patient parenteral nutrition. So that's the IV bags, the nutrition to IV. Next slide. So a typical day for me is an eight hour shift. I start at eight and I finish around four. Then I check my emails, I pick up my messages, and then I screen the patient list. Is there any new admissions? Is there any changes of diet? Which patient I need to see? So I need to look, the clues that I'm to, to screen a patient is that, is there any patients who are NPO? So that's nothing by mouth. It means that they cannot eat. For how long they cannot eat? Like if it's long, then I would talk to the team and say, when do you expect the patient to be able to eat? And if they cannot eat for a long time, then it gives me a clue that the, this patient will need tube feeding or parent or IV nutrition. Then, uh, so I would prioritize my list of patients to see. In the morning, there are like uh, rounds with the, the, the whole team. So this includes the nurses, the doctors, like pharmacy, physio, OT, and everyone would just discuss uh, the, the patients and what the plan is. So uh, during that time, like the doctors would tell me like which patient I need to see and what to do. And this helps me organize my day. So during the day I would do diet teachings. I would uh, see if my plan works. And then during meal times, I would see patients if they're eating or not, if there's any food changes I could do and even look if they're swallowing okay. And then at the end of the day, I compile my patients and do statistics. So is there any questions? So there is no question in the chat presently, but I'm sure that they are coming up shortly. Mm -hmm.
So Angela, um, I, would, I think meanwhile waiting for the question mm -hmm. to appear in the chat. Um, is there any specific like um, special specialization that you can do as a dietitian or like a step further if you want to do continuous like educations? There is a master's that you can do, but it's not necessary. So if you do the master's, like the higher managing management uh, positions will be more like offered to you. So you could be like a coordinator or you can also go into research. But if you want to just work in a hospital, you can just have your bachelor's degree. Uh, if you want to like specialize in like uh, enteral support and like enteral nutrition or IV nutrition, there is a CNSC specialization. And this is like, become a specialized um, dietitian for like TPN only. So that's the IV nutrition. Or if you're interested in diabetes, then there's the certified diabetes education educator that you could have. But if, before having that, you need to work 800 hours in diabetes specifically and then pass an exam. But with that, you can manage the insulin, you can manage the meds. So it's like they can do more than just teach uh, the diet. I'm pretty sure there's a, many more the, um, like specialization, but um, like those are the two like common ones. So question in the chat, how often do you prescribe, su uh, prescribe supplements to patients? So I would see if patients are malnourished or not, but uh, in the hospital, generally 50% of the patient are malnourished. So it's like if they're not eating that much, like if the nurses tell me this patient is not eating well, then I would just give it to them. It's better that they have it uh, on their tray and if they drink it, than just not having it and eat less. So I would just give it to them. And if they, if they request for it, then I would just give it to them. Um, next question. Uh, what is your take on stigma around healthy food equals like frivolous or not good food? So like in the hospital, of course, the, uh, the food doesn't really have flavor and <laughs> it's for the best for the yes. patient. We don't add salt. But the healthy food could be flavorful. Like if you know how to cook well, if you add spices, and if you know how to cook without the salt too, there are many recipes that is healthy. So, uh, so of course, like flavor, like good food could be healthy, and we need to learn to teach patients or teach people like that. Uh, like this is just a stigma and. We should be enjoying good food even, and if they are healthy. Okay, next question. May we know what salary we can expect from this job early and later? If so, you're not comfortable to answer this question, you can. It's okay because okay. Uh, we work for like the government. So there's okay. like a set uh, hourly salary, but it changes, I think, throughout the years. So the starting salary, if you work in the hospital is, 24.87 dollars an hour and it can go up to 43 dollars depending on how many years you you worked but if you worked in private practice so it's your own uh, like your own fees like you asked it, but it's generally like a um, hundred dollars per hour for the initial consult that's very and, like, that the gap between the the salaries are really strong. yeah but uh, for private practice, you need to build your own clientele. So in the beginning, it might be rough. But once you set up your own salaries, but I think from our order, we cannot charge less than $70 per hour wow. or something like that. But if you work in food service or, under, or other departments, then the salary changes. Like the $24.87 is just if you work in the hospital or CLSC, like in the healthcare system. Next question, um, it's from Adamo. He said he have, may have missed, but what is the difference between nutrition and diet dietetic program at McGill or otherwise? Uh, okay, so at McGill, there's dietetics and nutrition. Dietetics has a stage, so the internship included in the, the program, and this program leads you di directly to the profession. And you, once you graduate, you, have, you can be a dietitian. 
but for nutrition there's no stage so um you could go more towards like research or other fields of nutrition but you cannot be a dietitian uh, next question, could we do another degree while working as a nutritionist dietitian or it will be too draining? You actually could because if you work, for example, in the hospital, you could be uh, doing part time. Like if you're on the recall list and you well, if you're on the recall list then you need to adapt to their schedule. But if you work part time, then there are some days that you could go to school or, they, or your hospital can even give you like school leave to just finish your degree. But if you work like a private practice, like depending on which field that you work, it's very flexible to do another degree at the same time. A lot of my friends are doing their masters at the same time as working a little bit in the hospital. So it's, it is possible. Okay, so one last question because time up already. Um, how many years of university did you do? So Two. since I did uh, CJEP and then university, I don't need to do all my prerequisite. I already have it. So it's minimum 3.5 years at McGill. It cannot be shortened because of the stage. Like you need to have the stage at the time that they tell you. So you cannot change it. So it's minimum 3.5 years. Okay, I see. Thank you very much, Angela, for the presentation. And... Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So let's uh, welcome um, Nancy Yi Zhang, the pharmacist. Nancy, are you there? Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. I will let you present. OK. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Zhang. Um, thank you very much for having me today. I'm very happy to be here. So today, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about pharmacy. Um, so a little bit about the plan. So I'll introduce, you know, my background and why I chose pharmacy. Um, I'll, you know, give a little snippet of a day in the life of a pharmacist, um, whether it be in a community pharmacy. So that's like a pharma prix Jean Coutu that you see on every street or in a hospital setting. And also I'll talk a little bit about personally, my pros and cons of the program. Um, so yeah, next slide, thank you. So I was firstly admitted to the PharmD program at University of Montréal in 2016. So it is a doctorate program. So that's what a lot of people might not know about pharmacy is that you are a doctor of pharmacy. It's four years of studying. You have three years at school, like learning um, in classes and you have one year of internships. Um, so it was my first choice. Originally, I wanted to do it with a, mainly because my family really wanted me to become a pharmacist and they were like, it's a good choice, it's a good job, um, salary is good. So I went in with that mindset, but you know, as I uh, did my years, I realized that it was really, it, it's, nice, it's a nice profession, it's very intellectually stimulating and you know, I'll talk more about the pros later. And then I graduated er in early 2020 around like, what, May? Uh, you know, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic and uh, uh, I started working for that summer. So what I did is I worked at uh, many different pharmacies. So Pharmapri, Unipri, Proxim, they all are very similar in terms of the job, but, you know, each, each bannière, so what we call like, you know, the Pharmapri brand is a bannière. So each bannière is, um, has their own little things that are unique to them. I also worked in a clinic, so in a GMF, in French, that's, um, Group de médecine familiale. So there's a lot of like family doctors there. There are a lot of other health professionals too, like uh, like nutritionists, psychologists, um, physio, uh, occupational therapists sometimes. And uh, so I I work there as a pharmacist that would you know ass assist doctors answer any questions that they had um, and work on some cases that doctors gave me to work on. And I also did some clinical research. So I worked at the Centre de Recherche at the uh, Geriatric Center um, of um, Centre Universitaire Geriatrique Montréal. Um, and uh, I mainly looked at, you know, medication usage in older adults. So geriatrics means people over 65 years old. So um, that was also one of the things I did. And right now I went back to school. So I'm currently uh, studying medicine at uh, the University of Montréal. I have an exam uh, in two days, so very happy to be here and have that stress. But anyway, so next slide, please. Um, so a day in the life of a community pharmacy. So 
Um, a typical shift starts from nine, ends at five. You can do longer shifts. I have friends who do like 12 hour shifts. Um, you know, for me, those were my hours, nine to five or 12 to eight at my first pharmacy. So, you know, for someone that's not a pharmacist or doesn't work in a pharmacy, what you see is, uh, you know, for example, if you have like a grandparent that takes medication for diabetes, for cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, they would go to the pharmacy, they would wait like what, 15 to half an hour, and then they would get their medications and they would leave, right? So what happens behind the counter? So uh, as soon as, you know, your grandparent would go to the counter, you know, ask for their medications, the technicians, the pharmacy technicians would, you know, prepare the medications, renew them, pass them through the insurance, count them. So pharmacists don't all count pills. That's a very common misconception. And then they would bring it to us. So what does a pharmacist really do when, you know, we get, uh, you know, a basket with the patient's medication? So what we check for, um, you know, be before giving uh, the basket uh, to be dispensed is we check for compliance. So, you know, does this person take their medications regularly? If it's been like two months that they haven't come to the pharmacy, uh, might ask some questions, uh, check for any drug-drug interactions. So that's when two drugs, so medication, can interact with each other. And for example, one drug might increase the concentration of another drug, which can make that drug toxic. So sometimes we have to check that too. Um, any allergies, so if someone's allergic to penicillin and a doctor prescribes them penicillin, then that's a bad idea. Um, and also renal function, so that's how well your kidneys are uh, filtering uh, your blood. So as you know, people age, their kidneys filter less and less well. So some drugs can accumulate in the body. And that's why we wanna check, make sure that the doses on these drugs are okay for them. If there's any new medications, I have to explain them to the patient. So usually what I say is what it's for, how do we use it and what are the side effects? Um, and then the medication can be dispensed. Um, throughout the day also, we have pharmaceutical opinions that we send to prescribers. So these are basically letters um, that lets the prescriber know if anything that I mentioned in the above, so compliance, interactions, allergies, if there was an issue like that, I would send, you know, um, like, a, like a note to the prescriber, you know, either suggesting something, so an alternative medication, a dose decrease, uh, stopping a medication. So like that, you kind of correspond with, you know, doctors, dentists, optometrists, and whoever professional that can prescribe. Um, also throughout the day, you know, we have consultations and give advice. So the pharmacist is the most accessible healthcare professional you can have. You can literally walk up to a pharmacy counter and you can get professional healthcare opinions and advice. So, you know, people drop in during the day, people call us, um, things like I have a stomach ache, what should I take? Or, um, you know, I have, I'm constipated. What should I do? Oh, I have a toothache. Sometimes we, uh, suggest a product uh, that can be bought in the pharmacy without a prescription. And sometimes we would refer them to the appropriate person. So if you have a pink eye and it looks a little bit weird, then we'll usually refer to the optometrist. If you have like your, your a UTI that, uh, you, that we can't personally take care of, then we'll refer you to the doctor, for example. And under certain conditions, we can prescribe. So if, for example, your whole family uh, decides to go to Cuba for one week and you're afraid of having traveler's diarrhea, we can prescribe uh, antibiotics and prevention. If you have a UTI, so a urinary tract infection, and you've had an antibiotic prescribed in the past, we can re-prescribe that antibiotic for you under circumstances. Things like lice, acne, uh, herpes, not uh, genital herpes, but the cold sores. Um, a lot of things that, you know, recently in the last few years, there have been laws passed that enables the pharmacist to do a lot of um, to do a lot of professional acts like prescribing, adjusting dosages, etc. We also some pharmacies are um, specialized in compounding, so that's when a doctor prescribes a medication. It doesn't exist as a commercial product, so it, you can't buy it. So usually, it would be made at the pharmacy either with a powder and a cream. Um, sometimes it's mixing a cream, sometimes it's like a mouthwash that the dentist prescribes. So we can also do that. Um, management of the staff, when you're working as a pharmacist in a lab, at that moment, you are the boss. You, the pharmacy doesn't open until you come in the pharmacy. 
uh, doesn't close until uh, you leave. And uh, so you have, you know, a lot of staff that are under your supervision. If anything goes wrong, it's your responsibility. So you have pharmacy technicians, you have cashiers, you have, uh, you know, delivery persons and everything. And also we do vaccinate now. So, you know, with the, the flu shots coming in uh, in the next few weeks, months, we'll be vaccinating a lot. Next slide, please. So that was my experience in a community pharmacy. I asked my friend Anna, who's doing her uh, master's program to work as a hospital pharmacy, uh, hospital pharmacist. So she's currently a pharmacy resident at the Jewish General Hospital. She told me a little bit about, you know, her, her rounds. So she's been in the ICU. She's been uh, in uh, Emato Onko. So for example, the ICU, what she would do is she would round with the medical team. So the pharmacist is a healthcare professional that's directly part of the medical team. Um, you know, there's no dispensing medication. There's no like checking medications that we do at the, the, the community pharmacy. And uh, we make dosage adjustments uh, to and, and suggestions to the medical team. Um, in hematon oncology, that's like uh, blood cancers and cancers. So pharmacists are the ones that do the counseling. So, you know, if you have something, someone that just got diagnosed with cancer, it's a really big change in their lives and they're going to start chemotherapy. They might have a lot of questions. So the pharmacist is the one that's going to explain everything, answer any questions. We do prepare parental nutrition forms. I think that's like a shared responsibility with the dietitian, as Angela mentioned earlier. Um, and then we do adjust dosages of immunosuppressants, antibiotics, antifungals. So depending on different parameters, like uh, the concentration in the blood, how the patient is doing, the renal function, like I mentioned earlier, and a lot more because there's a lot of wards on in a hospital, cardiology, uh, pediatrics, uh, gastroenterology, internal medicine as a whole too. Next slide, please. So lastly, personally, some of my pros and cons, some of them are not really pros, some of them are really cons. It's just like, you know, just things that you should think about if you want to go into pharmacy. So job perspectives, excellent. You'll never be able to go without a job. Everywhere is hiring. Uh, salary, very good. If you guys want to know the starting price, not starting price, starting salary rate, I'll let you guys know. Um, expertise, like you are the expert of medications, you know, like no one else, no other healthcare professional knows as much uh, about medication as you do. So it's like a pretty good skill to have, you know, especially in a hospital or even in a pharmacy. Um, some doctors will actually call you to ask you questions. Um, lifestyle. Lifestyle, yes and no. Like as you as you see earlier, I said sometimes we have to work long shifts. There are 24-hour open pharmacies, so sometimes it's night shifts too. But I would say like 99% of pharmacists will not do that. Um, but you can choose your own, uh, you know, schedule. You don't need to work nine to five, five days a week. You can work pretty much whenever you want because the pharmacy is technically never closed. And you have autonomy, like you're the boss at the pharmacy. You're you kind of decide. Um, you know, what, how, how things are run and you, you kind of like the person in charge. Um, as for cons, very quickly, responsibility. It's like not really a con, but just something you have to think about. Like you, you do have a lot of responsibility. It is um, somewhat high stress, you know, it's medications, it's people's lives. One small thing could, you know, uh, go wrong for someone. You know, there have been people that have been given the wrong medication and have had really bad consequences and even death customer service because, you know, we're still in a pharmacy. Some people think we're like, um, uh, so like um, you, sometimes you do have to do the cash register. If uh, you know, everyone's busy, you do have to answer the phone. Like you do have to count medications sometimes if you want a uh, frontline worker. Like I said, it, he's very, the, the pharmacist is very accessible, but sometimes people take advantage of that. People come ask you five questions in a row and you have to like, uh, answer them um, and also you're a little bit isolated from other professionals like uh, you're in the, your pharmacy and sometimes like uh, a patient comes out of the hospital with a big discharge prescription you're alone at the pharmacy you don't really know what went on in the hospital you have to kind of figure it out based on what's written on the prescription and routine so if you start being a pharmacist now and in 20 years probably you'll be doing pretty much the same thing so you know if you like routine that's for you if you don't like routine well it's something that you need to think about. And I think next slide. Yeah, so that was uh, my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.
So thank you, Nancy. So before we start the question session, due to time con constraint, we will prioritize question about the profession. Specific question about admission to program will be noted down by YAPA to organize future conferences. So the first question is, um, you said that you're studying medicine now. Is that mean that you will become physician later? Yeah, so technically I can't be a pharmacist and a doctor at the same time. So when I'll start residency, so when I'll get my MD and I'll have to start to train to be a doctor, I'll have to ab um, to uh, abandon my uh, pharmacy license. Yeah. Okay, so another question, uh, can I still do pharmacy if I am bad at chemistry, especially organic chemistry? Oh, that's so fine. Yeah, <laughs> like we just have like one class of like chemistry. Uh, everyone hates it. Absolutely everyone hates it. And then we get through it and then we can get to the clinical stuff. Like the, the, the program at UDM is very clinical. Okay. It's not like you're, you're, you don't really learn. I mean, the first year you learn a little bit about, you know, chemical reactions, pH, whatever, but uh, like starting from second year, it's more like, you know, what are the guideline treatments? What are like clinical things you need to think about? So it's more it's fun that way. And uh, what is the difference between a pharmacist versus a pharmacologist? So a pharmacologist is a different program. So that's pharmacology. I think uh, McGill offers it. Uh, but a pharmacist is a healthcare professional. So you're a doctor of pharmacy. You are a, you work in a pharmacy and uh, you do more clinical things. So a pharmacologist is more, I think, research oriented, more about like the mechanism of drugs, uh, like discovering new pathways for medications. So one is more research, one is more like fundamental science, and the other one is more clinical. That's what I would say. Okay, a very long question. Um, will you get in touch with toxic element chemicals when you are doing your study in the university and when you are doing the research in the lab? Hmm. Is it, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm reading, yeah, so for sure, like, study in the university. So when we do study in the university, we don't do that much labs actually as a pharmacy student. We do it maybe two to three times as I can remember. And whenever, if we have to touch any like toxic compounds, then, you know, we have the protection requirement necessary. If you work as a pharmacist also, you know, you touch medications that are like toxic and everything, but you always wear gloves and everything. So usually it's fine. Um, okay. The research lab, we do clinical research. So I don't really work with chemicals and I don't think you need to be fully bilingual, but uh, I know people that have, you know, that are weak and strong in both languages. So, but you need to know a little bit, I think. So question, people are asking question about the starting salary. Do you want to share it? Yeah, that's fine. So uh, recently the market in Montreal is slightly saturated, which means that uh, the starting salary is lower than before. So I think most of my friends started around $55 an hour. Um, if you go like, you know, outside of Montreal, so like uh, Dans le Nord or like in uh, like Longueuil and like greater areas, uh, they pay much more because, you know, pharmacists are more needed there. If you do remplacement, so like substitute pharmacy, so you like travel a little bit everywhere to do relief work, like dépannage and everything, you can start at $80, go up to $100 an hour. That's also possible. Wow. Um, then uh, is your work busy? It seems there's a, not a lot of customer to go to the desk at pharmacy. Yeah, that's what people think. Like, oh, there's only one person waiting in front of me. Why is it taking so long? It's because people call. Uh, there are uh, like, there's so much more going on behind the counter. Like usually uh, I would say like 70% of the work that we do at a pharmacy is for people that either have called before or for like people uh, in residencies that we have to deliver medications to. Um, so the bulk of the work is not people that come to the pharmacy. Like those people we can usually serve. It's uh, maybe 20% of what we do in a day. Yeah. Um, question, uh, what does a pharmacy technician do? Like so a pharmacy technician is basically someone that just uh, helps out the pharmacist. So they will do technical work. So uh, counting pills, uh, renewing medications, answering the phone, um, like some text can verify if the pill is the correct pill, but it's really technical. The pharmacist really does more clinical work. So uh, like intellectual reflection work type of thing. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I will join two questions together is why did you decide to go to medicine after pharmacy? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's because uh, I think one of the cons I mentioned maybe was like isolation from other professionals. I didn't really like that. I didn't get like the whole story. You know, when I would get a prescription, usually I just know a little bit from what the patient says, but I really like uh, you know, med medicine, medical things. So that's why I wanted to go back. So my plan was either to do the master's to work in a hospital as a hospital pharmacist or uh, go to med school. So I applied to both. I got in both. So I went to medicine just to see if I liked it. And it's pretty good. Good. Um, question, is it easy to find a job as pharmacist or researcher if this profession is already a little bit saturated? Mm -hmm. When I said saturated, I meant in Montreal. Huh? So it's really still pretty easy to find a job, uh, like, you know, like from Laval and onwards and then Longueuil. But even in Montreal, like all my friends, all of the people that I know that are pharmacists that graduated with me have really good jobs that they are happy with. So, okay. yeah. So one last question due to the time. You mm -hmm. mentioned that pharmacists tend to be isolated from other health professionals, but does it happen that you have to call the patient doctor to know more about the patient's case? Yes, at your own discretion, because, you know, doctors don't like to be bothered and they're always pretty busy. We can never get a hold of them. So, you know, if it's really, really important, if the patient, if what the patient tells you and what you have on the prescription is really two different things, then yes, I will call a doctor. Typical situation is if patient hands me an antibiotic and he tells me that he's allergic to a similar antibiotic, then I will have to call the doctor and, you know, suggest a different one. That happens a lot. Um, but I don't call unless I have to because everyone's pretty busy. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you no for problem. your presentation. And we will welcome our next speaker is Belinda. Next slide, please. <laughs> Belinda Zhao, she is a resident student now in medicine. Belinda, are you there? Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, hello, Belinda. I will let you present. Hi, so my name is Belinda. I am a first year medical resident in internal medicine at Université de Sherbrooke. So I'm also a member of YAPA and today I'll be doing a presentation, a very brief overview on the career of medicine. So next slide. So what is medicine? Uh, here I copy pasted a uh, Wikipedia definition that I think uh, resumes pretty well uh, the definition and the description of medicine. So medicine is basically the practice of caring for a patient, managing the diagnosis, uh, treating their symptoms, treating their medical condition, as well as promoting their health. Medicine obviously encompasses of many uh, different types of practices. Next slide. So uh, there are four medical schools in Quebec, uh, the Anglophone one being McGill University and uh, the three other ones being Francophone. Uh, we have Université de Montréal, we have Université de Sherbrooke and we have Université Laval in Quebec City, which is where I personally did my medical training. Um, so basically the road to becoming a medical doctor varies from person to person. I'll just do a brief overview of what uh, are the steps to becoming a doctor and then after I'll talk about the course and duration of studies. So uh, basically I would say roughly two thirds of uh, the people that were in my medical school uh, were from CJEP. So basically you could apply to medical school from CJEP after doing uh, your credits in health sciences. Um, and then you have people that decide to do an undergraduate or a bachelor's degree before they could apply during or after they finish their bachelor's degree, they could apply to medical school. Some people decide to pursue a master's after and then apply after, or even a PhD uh, and you could apply to medical school after as well. There's also people that work in another field for a few years. Uh, for example, in my class, there were pharmacists, there were, nursing, there were nurses, there were even people that were in music. Uh, that decided after a few years of practice, they wanted to go back to school and pursue medicine. So honestly, in my class, there were many different backgrounds. Uh, so after you get into medical school, uh, you get you study to get your medical degree. And then after you get your medical degree, you go into what we call residency, which is postdoctoral training. So basically, you're a doctor, but you're kind of training in that your certain field of practice. Um, after residency, you could decide or not to pursue what we call a fellowship, which is even further specialization in your field of practice. So that I say it's optional, but depending on where you want to work, it might be a requirement to do extra training in your certain field of specialization in order to practice in that certain area or hospital. Uh, so 
Oh, go back, sorry, go back to the other slide, thank you. <laughs> so for the course and duration of studies, um, it really varies depending on what school you go to, what kind of specialization you decide to go into, but we could divide it into a few different categories. So uh, the first being preclinical studies, or we could also call that pre-clerkship. So these are the few years you spend being a university student, you go to class, uh, you learn the theory behind the different diseases, how to manage them, how to investigate them, how to treat them and how do you apply these theories into clinical situations. So um, roughly at McGill and UDM, uh, generally CDEP students have to do a pre-med or med P year, and then after do two years of preclinical studies. At Université de Sherbrooke, it's a bit different because um, everyone does around two years of preclinical studies. So Université de Sherbrooke, people tend to be one year younger than their fellow peers at other universities. At Université Laval in Quebec City, uh, you could choose to do two years, 2.5 or three years uh, of preclinical studies. Personally, I did two years, but in general, uh, as I am a CGEP student, most people actually do two, three years or uh, two and a half years. So after you're done your preclinical studies, you start what we call clerkship. clerkship. Clerkship is basically when we do clinical rotations in the hospital. So we finally start going into the hospital, seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, basis and basically uh, start learning how to become a doctor. So this is two years everywhere. So after clerkship, you do your final licensing exam, you get your MD degree, and then in that process, you what we call go into residency, which is your postdoctoral studies. So at this point, you're already a medical doctor, but you're still training to become uh, basically a specialist in your field of, of study. Uh, and it's also when you start get, getting a salary. So this duration, it could vary between two to around five years, two years being the minimum residency time that we see uh, in people that do family medicine. Uh, most specialties have averaged around five years total of residency. It could be even more than that. Um, and then after, if you decide to pursue a fellowship, which yet again, it's further specialization in your certain field of study, it is around one to two years time. And some people decide to do even more than one fellowship. So it could be even more years. Uh, as an example, uh, if I take a, a random person, get into medical school, decide to do five years to get their medical degree. So they go into residency, for example, they go into internal medicine, they decide to pursue cardiology, that is six years total of residency. Uh, and then after pursuing cardiology, they decide that wow, they really, really want to become an intensive care doctor. Uh, so they decide to pursue a fellowship in ICU, which is two years time. So if we calculate the total um, time from beginning of medical school to practicing as a doctor, uh, that is a 13 years time of education. So you could go to the next slide. So obviously in medicine, it encompasses a lot of types of practices. We kind of divide it into family medicine, which is primary care basically. Uh, we have non-surgical specialties such as pediatrics, psychiatry, internal medicine, radiology, we also have surgical specialties. We have general surgery, urology, plastic surgery. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna go over all of the different specialties. Um, I invite you to go on Google uh, and search the list of spe specialties if you're interested. It, you could have like a huge list of uh, all the different types of practices that you could uh, get with medicine. So it kind of caters to many different types of interests, lifestyle needs, um, personality traits. So it's a very uh, varied field. Next slide. Um, for the pros and cons of practicing in medicine, obviously it really depends on what kind of person you are, what kind of specialty you're in. So, uh, but I would say in general, uh, for the pros, it is quite a stimulating field with rewarding results. You're seeing uh, patients, interesting medical cases on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you're investigating, managing the symptoms, treating their medical conditions, and you're seeing how they evolved under the treatment that you implemented and seeing them evolve favorably under the treatment is a very rewarding feeling. Also in the midst of all that, you could create gratifying relationships with your patients as well as your coworkers. Um, practicing medicine requires teamwork skills. You have to be able to work with other health professionals in order to be able to take care of the patient in the best way that you can. And I would also say that one, in one of the pros, it is quite a secure salary once you're able to get a job. Next slide. So for the cons of medicine, I would say that it is quite long duration of studies. 
uh, as I said before, it could be like uh, more than 10 years of study even after, um, for example, you, you did a PhD and you still decide to do uh, medicine, then it could be quite long in total. Um, it is quite a high stress environment. You have big responsibilities. Every decision that you make basically has a direct impact on the patient's health and on their life. So it is quite big responsibilities to shoulder. It is also uh, quite a high competition to get into medicine, to get into medical school, you're competing with and uh, with other brilliant and intelligent students. Uh, and when you get into medicine, it is also constant competition. So it is hard not to compare yourself to other people that are very, very brilliant. Um, there's also possible insecurity with the location and specialty you will end up with. Uh, personally, I cannot guarantee that I will be able to practice in the city of Montreal in the future. I might end up in a very peripheral region if that is the only spot available in my personal specialty. So next slide. Um, so I'll go quickly, uh, the day in the life of an internal medicine resident. So I started my first year of residency uh, on July 1st, 2021. Uh, I would say that is very different depending on which specialty I am rotating in. Uh, personally, I started in the intensive care unit. So that was my first uh, rotation during residency. I would say that it was very long hours. We were often on call uh, and the patients that we see are the most sick in the entire hospital. They're the most unstable. They're the ones that are intubated on a ventilator and they could crash at any second. So I would say it was high stress and long hours. I could have, uh, for one week, I remember I worked more than 80 hours a week and more than 12 days in a row. So it kind of took a toll on me and it was very uh, exhausting. And currently I'm actually in my pulmonology rotation. So it's the specialty that focuses on lung disease. I'm in the hospitalization unit. So uh, basically uh, on average, I work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And what I do is a mix of really clinical work, teaching and learning as well. So basically on the hospitalization unit, we work on admitting new patients that come in from the emergency department. Uh, we go see every patient that we have on the hospitalization unit to see how they're evolving with the treatment that we started. Um, and also most days we also have many presentations. So during lunchtime we eat at the same time and then we listen to other people presenting on different topics. And uh, also we might be required to prepare a presentation as well. So I would say that it's a very, uh, there's a lot of variety uh, that happens during our day. So next slide. So basically call is something that is basically inevitable during uh, medicine and as a resident. So what do we do on, when we're on call? So I'm going to mostly talk about with my personal experience as an internal medicine resident in Sherbrooke University, um, a first year resident. So we have weekend calls, we have night calls, and we have overnight calls. So during the weekend, if you're on a day call, it's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And it's kind of similar to weekday shifts, but there's less staff. So basically, you, you have a bit of more of a workload. And if anyone has any questions, you know, they go to you. Overnight calls. Um, in first year of residency, we cover ICU as well as hospitalization units in internal medicine and the subspecialties as well. Our attending physician is at home. As a first year resident, I am supervised by a senior resident. So that in that sense, it's pretty like uh, secure. Uh, so any questions that the nurses have on the patients or that any other person has on the patient, it comes to me and then I have to kind of manage that. It can be very calm or can be very busy on overnight shifts. It happens that, you know, I don't have any time to sleep and I'm just running around the entire hospital just trying to manage every call that I get for every single issue. So next. So in conclusion, uh, I hope you kind of learned something on uh, medicine. It was a very quick, quick uh, presentation because such a vast field. Uh, so we could uh, go to the questions. So before we start the question sessions, uh, first, thank you, Belinda. And then second, I want to remind everyone that due to the time constraint, we will prioritize question about the profession. Specific question about admission to a program will be noted down by YAPA to organize future conferences. So you guys are welcome to pop your question in the chart. Okay, so is the med program at the university? Um, what is your specialty right now? Uh, right now I am in internal medicine. Uh, internal medicine basically it's kind of complicated because basically we do three years of what we call core internal medicine. So we kind of go through every single subspecialty of internal medicine. 
Uh, there's a lot of subspecialties in internal medicine, including cardiology, gastroenterology, uh, pulmonology, ICU, endocrinology. So you guys could go on Google to search up that list. So in three years, I have to reapply to go into that specific field. So I'm not yet again, like set completely, but I'm in internal medicine right now. Um, I think you, you, you messed up some people in the chat by seeing like different people in, in university. They're asking if the med program is open to CJEP students. Oh yeah, uh, sorry. What I meant is that in Quebec, most you know, medical students are from are applied from CJEP. So yes, you are uh, eligible. Okay. <laughs> Some people ask, can you have a life while studying and working at the same time if you do 80 hours per week? <laughs> um, well, it, like you could have a life that, like depending on what specialty you're rotating on. I would say that it's all, it's important to be able to keep a balance. Obviously I try to find time to study like during the day, if it's not that busy, I try to read a bit on the cases that I have. So it kind of integrates. We also have a lot of time that we are, people are teaching us uh, theories. So we kind of integrate that as well. And just working with the patients, seeing your cases also makes you learn a lot. And uh, yeah, on the weekends, if I don't, I'm not, I'm not working Well, I have time to hang out, chill with my friends. So yeah, it's possible to have a life. <laughs> okay, another question. I would like to know how come a music background student can study medicine? Do they need science background as prerequisite? Um, that is a very interesting question. Uh, obviously, I didn't do music before, but um, yeah, you have to have your health sciences prerequisite. So maybe some people go back to do their these credits in school and then they apply to medical school. Um, next question, how diverse are your physician colleagues at hospitals? Uh, do you have colleagues with a foreign medical degree or degree from another Canadian provinces? Um, yes, uh, there's sometimes there are uh, colleagues that have like uh, that came from other countries and were able to pursue continue their uh, medical uh, profession like profession here. I'm not that familiar with that process, however, and um, sorry, what was the other part? Um, for um, from another Canadian provinces, I would say that in Sherbrooke University, it's pretty rare because French is very important since it's like almost 100% French. So I would say if you're from another province, it's uh, more difficult to uh, practice in Sherbrooke if you don't know French, obviously. Okay, next question. Percentage of student that goes to study for a master degree? Do you know? Um, that is quite a hard question to ask because it just changes depending on what year you're on. But um, I would say in my year, yeah, it's a very hard question to, to say because it depends on every year who goes into medical school from CJEP. Uh, and if not, like mo a lot of people pursue like a master's after applying. Uh, you could also apply during your, your master's as well. But I would invite you to go on the website to make sure um, you have better information than I could provide with you. Are there limited spots to enter general medicine residency? Uh, general medicine, do you mean internal medicine or family medicine? But yes, there are limited spots for every single residency uh, a spot. I would say the most competitive is obviously surgery. For example, neurosurgery, I think there's only two spots in Quebec per year. For family medicine, there are a few hundreds in Quebec, so it's much less competitive. Internal medicine, I would say it's like average competitiveness. Okay, and then we have a hands up from Hanson, you can unmute yourself and open your video. Hi, Belinda, thanks for your presentation. Uh, very succinct on the medical school education. Um, just wondering, I guess this is the context of today's conference. Um, how do you see uh, your role as a doctor um, and how are you, are you able to integrate it into promoting community health? For example, um, you know, this YAPA involvement, it's really cool and you're giving back to your community and helping in that way. Do you see um, either as an internal medicine uh, physician or as a doctor in general, do you see it uh, playing a role later on? Um, that's quite an interesting question. Thank you for asking that. 
Um, I would say that my involvement with Yapa is that I really want to be able to, as an Asian, uh, as a Chinese person, to be able to provide back to our community in the future. Obviously, right now, I'm still in the beginning of my residency training in internal medicine. So I'm mostly trying to, you know, integrate these new responsibilities, trying to keep up with all the theory and all the different uh, training that we need to do in residency. But for sure, uh, in the future, I... Uh, see envision myself to be able to provide back to the Asian community uh, in Montreal in some way or another. That's why for now I'm uh, implicated in Yapa and I'm interested in like continuing this implication to see how, you know, I could integrate this uh, aspect of helping the Asian community in the future in my future practice. Very cool, thank you. So another question from the chat. Um, what is the difference between resident and fellowship? Um, basically, uh, resident is that, for example, I would just give an example. For example, someone is a resident in general surgery. So that is five years of residency training. So you kind of go through uh, all those five years training for to become a general surgeon. Um, after your five years, technically, you could practice as a general surgeon. But some people decide to pursue a fellowship. Fellowship is basically even further specializing in uh, your field. So for example, general surgery, um, I think you could specialize in colorectal cancer, for example. So you'll be really a specialist of that certain thing. And some hospitals actually require people doing a fellowship before you're able to enter as a, as a practicing doctor, depending on what kind of needs they want. So that's kind of the difference um, generally. <laughs> Um, next question, what, uh, how do you find the study in University of Sherbrooke? You're in Sherbrooke, right? Uh, University Laval was where I did my medical school, but I saw the okay. question, is it harder to integrate yeah. as Asian students? Mm -hmm. um, I would say my year, there was quite a few uh, people from Montreal of different uh, ethnicities, like there, I, there was a few Asian people. Um, so I was able to, you know, become friends with them as well. Um, obviously, the city is quite different from Montreal. So in that sense, it's, it's, it was a bit harder for me to be able to stay there for quite a long time. Uh, I would often come back to Montreal because, you know, my family, my, most of my friends are still here. But I would say that the medical training is very adequate and, um, you know, it's, it's very doable. Next question. What is the most important aspect uh, after your grades or R score? to get into medical school? Um, so obviously grades, our score, it's, it's an important aspect to get into med school. Um, in your CV, I would say it really, you know, it really depends. Uh, I cannot say one thing is most important, but I, I feel like if you're a well-rounded person, uh, that's very important for the medical schools to know that you're able to work hard, but also able to take time off to pursue, you know, hobbies that you, you really enjoy because a well-balanced person is, much able, much more able to take care of a patient uh, because your own well-being kind of reflects on how you practice. Um, but I would say it's important to, you know, have some experience in the medical field, volunteering, you know, shadowing in a hospital. I feel like it kind of gives you also yourself an idea of how it is to be a doctor, how it is to be in a hospital. Um, I would say, you know, research and stuff like that. As a CJEP student, obviously it's, you know, it's not that important. I mean, if you have a certain interest in it, maybe you could start a bit of, you know, start a bit of research in CJEP, it's not going to be detrimental or anything, but it's not like a really great requirement. Um, and extracurriculars obviously involve yourself like in committees and leadership groups. Uh, it's always welcome in a CV. And um, it's not a question in the chat, but uh, I, I, uh, because I work in General Jewish Hospital we, and we have uh, um, fellow or resident from Saudi Arabia and just question to you, do you, is it like easy to apply for a board fellowship or residency? Did you consider that before? Um, yeah, because it's a, it's a different medical system. So basically if I want to go to do residency in the USA, for example, I need to pass their exam. So their exam is called step one, step two, step three. Um, and it's a huge exam that, you know, costs a lot, take a lot of studying. It's like eight hours exams. So I, I know a lot of uh, medical students from McGill, they do those uh, exams to be able to do, potentially do residency or practice in the future in the United States. But uh, personally, I think for now, I'm gonna stay in, in Montreal and then uh, 
depending on uh, what happens in the future, maybe I'll see if uh, I want to go elsewhere. So thank you, Belinda. That will be all for today. Thank you very much to participate in our um, conference. So the next, uh, bye bye Belinda, thank you very much. And the next one will be the other professions. It will be Yuxing and me who will be presenting. So I'll let you Yuxing start. Hi everyone, my name is Yuxing Hu. I'm a candidate of Masters of Science in uh, Physical Therapy, obtaining my degree in November, 2021. I'll give the next presentation with my colleague, Huilin Zhang. She's a registered nurse and she's also the host of today. Uh, in this two-day conference, we actually invited 15 healthcare professionals from different fields of practice, but there are still many other professions in Quebec that we won't be able to cover in detail due to time constraints. And therefore, me and Hui Lin will give a brief overview of the following professions based on credible sources that we put at the bottom of the page. There won't be any Q&A session for this presentation. And if you're interested to know more about these professions, let us know in your survey to get a, guide us to plan future conferences. So first, next slide, please. Orthotists and prosthetists are specialists of orthotics and prosthetics. So orthotics are devices that compensate for physical deficit. For example, patients who had a stroke might have a drop foot. So when they walk, they might hurt themselves if the foot stays behind. And they can wear an AFO to lift their foot up. Some types of AFO can also give stability to the knee to prevent knee buckling and prevent fall. And on the other hand, prosthetics replace a part of the body. So for example, patients with advanced diabetes, vascular disease or infections might need to be amputated or people in a road accident could lose a limb and having prosthetics can help them improve their function and mobility. Next slide, please. Orthotists and prosthetists uh, need a DEC CJEP diploma. In Quebec, Collège Montmorency and Collège Mérissi offer this program. After the DEC, there is uh, an opportunity to do a certificate at Université du Québec en Abitibi Démiscamingue. These professions need to be part of uh, the, or the Ordre des Technologues Professionnels du Québec and they mainly work in rehabilitation centers. They're responsible for manufacturing, adjusting, repairing, and modifying orthotics and prosthetics after these are medically prescribed. Another interesting profession is speech language pathologists. And they're also called speech therapists. In Quebec, they need to obtain a master's degree from Université Laval, Université de Montréal, Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières or uh, McGill University. They can work in schools, healthcare institutions, or private practice. They are specialists of voice, speech, language, and swallowing. Their patient population could be kids with autism or language delay. They could also be patients after a stroke who have aphasia, which means difficulty understanding or producing speech. And these patients with stroke might also have dysarthria, which is difficulty of the muscles to generate movements to talk. The clientele could also be patients who had a laryngectomy, which is a surgical removal of the larynx. The next, present, uh, the next profession is audiology. Audiologists in Quebec need to ob obtain a master's degree from Université de Montréal or Université Laval. Just like speech language pathologists, they can work in healthcare institutions and private practice. Their roles include the prevention of hearing loss, assessment and treatment of people with hearing disabilities and problems associated with the vestibular system, which mostly involves dizziness. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. So I, I will be talking about clinical professionists and um, uh, respiratory therapists for the other profession. So clinical professionist, its degree is a DSS, so Diplôme d'études supérieures spécialisées. 
This program is only offered in French at the University of Montreal. The candidate need to be, um, be prior to this one, need to hold a bachelor degree in biomedical science with an extra corporal profusion orientation or undergraduate diploma in the field of health science or biological science or other degree deemed equivalent. But in the whole Quebec, there's only University of Montreal who offers this. And as far as I know, they accept 10 person per year. Uh, so it's a really rare profession. And once they're out of the hospital, the, all the hospital jumps on them um, to, to, to get them. Uh, what they do is they basically control only one machine and it is the ECMO machine or the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So the ECMO machine is a much smaller machine and the cardiopulmonary, I will show you guys picture afterwards, it's a much bigger machine. And these two machines, what does it do is it replace the lungs. So it circulates the blood with, we circulate the blood in the machine and it oxygenates the machine um, for the lungs. So what type of patient needs this type of machine? Like COVID patient, when your lung is kaput and kaput to the point that you cannot use it anymore, we need to rest the lungs a little bit. We will put patient on this ECMO machine to uh, circulate the, the blood to make the patient temporarily alive. And when we see the lungs has um, recovered pretty well, we will stop the machine and um, re-give all the bloods and then the blood will restart to circulating within the, the, the lungs. Um, so that said, this uh, type of um, clinical professionals can only work in ICU. The other place that they can work will be the operation room. So um, when we do operation on open heart surgery patients, uh, we don't want the blood to go in the heart uh, for that period of time when we are operating on the heart. So we will put patient on this cardiopulmonary bypass machine to pump the heart to oxygen, uh, pump the heart, pump the, the blood throughout the body and oxygenate the, um, the whole body. The next slide is a trigger warning for blood uh, serious this time. So everyone, if you are not fan of blood, just close your eyes. I will warn you guys when you guys can open your eyes again. Next slide. So this is two pictures I taken from my ICU theory class. The top one is one bypass that we put in the femoral artery. So if you guys can see this little mark of blue and red on top of it, it's one, the red is the arterial and the blue is the venous blood. So we take the blood from the, the red, uh, the blue one, and then we, ox no, we take the, from the blue one, then we oxygenate it and we give it back to the, the, the body by the red one. And that um, machine is operated by clinical professionists. Um, so that's at the bedside. And if you want to see the bottom picture, that is if the femoral um, access is not uh, available, um, then we would go directly on the heart. So this you can see on the, this is the little, little red mark, that's the red, um, that, that, that's the arterial blood. And then the, the blue one on the bottom, that's the venous blood. So um, that's ECMO machine at bedside. Uh, next slides uh, will be the cardiopulmonary. Uh, this is oh, this is the ECMO machine. It's uh, well at us ICU. It's mostly the one on the left side. It's a small machine. Sometimes you can have a bigger standing machine in other hospital on the left side. And um, next one, please. And this machine is the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So all the open heart surgery patient will be on this monitor uh, for the duration of the operation in the operation room. And then the, card, um, the clinical professionist, her job he, or his job is to make sure that this machine is working permanently and the patient is getting his blood um, uh, 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 well oxygenated. And at the same time, they will Give, they can give medication or they can do a blood test via this machine also. Next slide. So that's it for clinical perfusionists. You guys can open your eyes again. Uh, for respiratory therapists, it is one of my most 
uh, worked colleague in ICU. They, uh, the degree is the DEC. It's a uh, three year CJAP training for Diplôme d'études collégiales. Um, they don't offer any bachelor degree in any of the university here, but they do in the States. They have a professional order. It's the Ordre Professionnel des Nanothérapeutes du Québec. Um, they can work in a uh, hospital, operational, emergency, ICU, NICU. The NICU is neonatal ICU. They can also work in, work in long-term care center or like CHSLD or CISC. Job content, they provide cardiopulmonary system care by maintaining, restoring, or assisting the airway function. Um, they can do it in an emergency situation, so cardiac or pulmonary arrest, or treat of respiratory diseases like asthma, emphysema, uh, cystic uh, fibrosis. Um, then the machine that you guys see on the slides is a ventilator machine. It's the exact the same one that we have in the, in the Jewish ICU, and we've been using it a lot and we've been ordering it a lot since the COVID started. Uh, so that's that. Next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> so the this is all the machine or medication, well, a part of the medication machine that the respiratory therapists do. The one in big that you guys see, it's a bypass machine. It helps the patient to sleep better uh, at night because some people they, they have apnea, sleep apnea at night. So that keep the airway open so they don't need to wake up during, in the middle of the night and short of breath. Um, the little bottom one, the thing like this that you guys see, it's an airway guard. So in case the patient is in pulmonary cardio uh, arrest, we will put that in to make sure that the airway is still open and we can give oxygen uh, through that airway. Uh, they also, like, uh, if you don't work in an ICU situation, you will also give some asthma and uh, medication via the pumps. Um, that's one of the major uh, job that the uh, respiratory therapists do. Um, they can also give more complicated medication via the ventilator, but I didn't know the name and they wasn't, I wasn't able to find it, so that's it. Um, this is an intubated little prenatal baby. So you can see the little tube that entered in his mouth and we tape it his, around his mouth to make sure the tube stays in place. So uh, respiratory therapists, they really cover all age of people. They can be uh, premature, preborn, and we can still put a tube inside the mouth, down the throat, on, on, in the lungs until 99 years old if you really want us to push that further for your care. So that's it for um, our presentation. So thank you very much again. Uh, so uh, that was our final uh, presentation for today. For next Saturday, at the same time, we'll be hosting our second conference and presenting eight other health professions. You are welcome to join us again. And for all the honest questions or comments about today's conference, please feel free to leave your question or comments in our Facebook or WeChat message, or just by completing the survey. And in the end, I would like to give a big, big thank you to all of our speakers. Um, actually, can you, the slides, <laughs> please? Yeah, uh, to our, our speakers, Vidasiu, Marwa Cafe, Justin Pham, Angela Lo, Nancy, and Belinda Jiao. And a big thank you to Elite College who sponsored this um, uh, event and all the collaborators, Triple A Sport, Mariano Polis, Chinese Student Association, McGill Chinese Graduate Student Association, Chinese Student and Scholar Association at the University of Montreal, Lingua 3660, McGill Chinese Mental Health Wellness, uh, Society, College McGill, Quebec, Chinese Volunteer Association in Canada, Filipino Organization of Concordia University Students, Canadian Federation of Chinese Students, Chinese Psychology Student Association, Montreal Education Forum, and a uh, United Vietnamese Student Association of Eastern Canada. And big, big thank you for YAPA support team, Yuxin Kingfei, Melissa Tianzi, Teddy, Natalie, and Jessica for making this uh, event possible. So, See you guys next next Saturday. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, survey guys. <laughs> if you guys can complete the the survey, uh, it will help us a lot, a lot. Or if you guys have plans to attend to next uh, Saturday's event, you guys can wait until then. But 
please complete the survey as soon as you can. Thank you.